Hello and welcome to another episode of But Have You Heard About Conspiracy Theory Edition. Da, da, da. I am your host, Courtney. And today, instead of being joined by my wonderful partner, Matt, I am joined by my friend, Jess. Hello, everybody. So excited to have her here because we're going to do kind of a piggyback off of our last conspiracy theory. And neither Matt nor I, even though Matt is from the state of New York, have been to the Statue of Liberty. But we want to talk about one of the Mandela effects that kind of apparently have a, has arisen since people thought the world has ended in 2012. And it is that the Statue of Liberty isn't where it's supposed to be. People take photos in front of this fake podium. And that if you go to like Google Maps, you see nothing where the Statue of Liberty is supposed to be. And then there's people like there's a whole bunch to it. And it's not that the Statue of Liberty is fake. It's that people remember things very differently from their childhoods, from what apparently happened in their childhoods is kind of the way I'm going to talk about it. So there are some photos to this. Um, there's going to be a link to a beautiful Google Drive so you can see some of these photos in the description. And if you're watching this on YouTube, which I don't know, happy one of you, there's going to be beautiful photos while this is going through. First off, I didn't know there was an explosion of the Statue of Liberty back in 1960. 1916, <laughs> sorry. 16, yeah, I was in 1960, that'd be a... <laughs> It was the Black Tom explosion, and it was an act of sabotage by the Germans against the U.S. to destroy some ammunitions that were made by the U.S. that they were going to send out to the Allies. And it was like $20 million worth of military goods that were destroyed. And the incident, which happened prior to the U.S. entry into World War I, also damaged the Statue of Liberty. You're not allowed to go into the torch anymore because of it. And it was the largest artificial non-nuclear explosions to ever occurred. So the first thing I want to talk about with the Statue of Liberty conspiracy theory is that people remember taking photos from the torch, but you're not allowed in the torch and you haven't been allowed in the torch since 1916. This happened July 30th. So July 29th and July 30th, you could have gone into the torch. Past that, you have to climb up this little baby ladder to get to the torch. And the only people who go up there are groundskeepers to replace lights. Mm -hmm. So there's a photo of somebody being like, hey, I took this from the torch. And when I went there, when I was like, I guess a kid or whenever they went, they're like, I'm special. I was in the torch, but you can't like literally going to the Statue of Liberty's website. It <coughs> literally says since the bl black Tom explosion, you can't go there and you can only go into the Statue of Liberty's crown with a reservation. And if you look at these photos, these people think that they were at the top because they were probably told this is as far as you can go. Right. And they thought it was the damn light torch. I'm making a motion about the Statue of Liberty, but they thought it was the damn torch. And really they're in the crown and they got special permission. So they might've been a special group. Like, oh my God, we're going to New York city and we're from like Nebraska and we're going to go and we're going to get special privilege. I, that's not a Nebraska accent. That's a really bad Midwestern accent, but it worked. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's not even like special permission. As, as far as I remember, I remember you had to have a ticket, like so there is a ticket that you buy to go like up to the Statue of Liberty, like to do like the, to the base of the Statue of Liberty. There's stairs that get you there. There is another ticket if you want to go up to the crown and you have to buy both. If you want to go up to the crown, you can't just buy like the crown one and like, no, you have to buy both. So it's kind of a tourist trappy situation. So a lot of folks, I think looking at the photo, especially one of the photos that you shared with me ahead of time um, of somebody, you know, this is a photo from the torch. It to me looks like the crown, because if you look at the old photos of the torch, um, or even like the photo of like the very first torch before the black time explosion, it's like four people up on this very, very tiny torch. And it's like, no glass, nothing. Like there's nothing surrounding it. There's, it's not very big. When you look at the photos that are like on Google maps or whatever that say, you know, I looked at the torch or I, I, this is a photo from the torch. There's like paneling and there's glass and there's space. And to me, that looks like the crown. I didn't go up to the crown when I was there because I was not doing all those stairs. No, thank you. <laughs> Unless you're doing that on a regular basis, you wouldn't know if you went as far as the freaking, you know, no the torch versus the crown. It's so far. Right. I mean, hell, I mean, you used to live in Texas. You ever do those natural bridge caverns tours? You go down in the freaking uh, No, but I know a bunch of people who did. <laughs> the thing is like, you feel suckered because there's one where you don't feel like you're dying. And the other one, they're like, okay, well, um, we just had to leisurely walk down some stairs. Now we're going to huff it past people going up. And honestly, <laughs> That is when I realized I was really out of shape like seven years ago. And I was like, shit, <laughs> well, this, uh, this walking challenge we about to do is not going to go well. <laughs> yeah. So I think people also just remember things. And we, we all have bad memories and we take, mm -hmm. remember things because the world is so big now, especially with technology 
you take photos to remember things, I think, because also we all live a lot damn longer. So we have a lot more time to do stuff and we have ready to go places. And when it comes to the Statue of Liberty, you took a photo, but you may not have remembered that like you didn't tag it in Facebook, like this is the crown. And you're like, oh, that looks like it was probably the torch. That was the tallest part you could go to. It had to be the torch. Well, and I think Americans also kind of have selective hearing, you know, just like a little bit. Um, and so when, you know, your tour guide is saying, this is the highest point of that you can go to on the Statue of Liberty. I think a lot of people hear this is the highest point on the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. And you just don't realize it. And again, it's that selective hearing or you hear what you want to hear or that you process yep. processing it completely different. And mm-hmm. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that you actually have you were also historic um, history major from the yes, college. I have a BA in history and you have like a museum background. So you understand museums. Uh-huh. And that was one of the other reasons I wanted to bring you on because literally <laughs> talking about Americans and tourists in general <laughs> in front of the most random crap and be like, Oh, this was fancy. And literally, I think when I was in Europe, I felt, I felt victim to this. I was stupid. I was in college. I'm allowed to say this, but I remember taking a picture in front of like the, a cobblestone wall. And when I did it, I think I thought it was something else. And honestly, I think it's just because I thought it was pretty. But now I'm like, yeah, that's totally a church. And I'm like, no, it's not. There's no way that was a church. <laughs> yeah, I think for a lot of folks, especially for, again, like these big touristy areas, um, there's a lot of hype surrounding them. When you go to New York City, like most people are going to go to the Statue of Liberty or at least see it. And it's a big deal. I mean, it is pretty ingrained in our American history. You, you hear a lot of the stories, again, like about Ellis Island and people seeing the Statue of Liberty as they come in as immigrants to Ellis Island. It's kind of this symbol of America in general. And so there's a lot of hype around that when you go. And so I think sometimes, too, we hype it up in our mind before we even get there. And so that also, I think, contributes to that selective hearing and that selective memory afterwards, because we're trying to make sure that our, that what we're seeing and what we're experiencing lives up to that hype that we've created. Exactly. You brought up um, Ellis Island. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have this misconception that the Statue of Liberty is on Ellis Island, when in actuality, it's on a different island, but people go to Ellis Island and think that they're going to see the Statue yes. of Liberty. Yes. This is part of that Mandela effect. A lot of people swear that the Statue of Liberty was on Ellis Island and that, that part of this parallel universe is that now it's on a different island, but they swear that they remember it was on Ellis Island. Ellis Island and Liberty Island are run by the same historical foundation um, and because they're right next to each other. You can very clearly see the Statue of Liberty from Ellis Island because Liberty Island is just like a hop, skip, and a jump away, like just like a little bit of water away. It's very, very close. Ellis Island is kind of unremarkable looking. It's kind of like a big fancy municipal building. I remembered when we went past it on the the boat tour that we did, a lot of the kids in my class, because I was I was there on a high school trip, a lot of kids in my class were like, Oh, that must be the UN building or that must be like the governor's house. <laughs> they like just thought it was like a big fancy municipal building. And no, that's Ellis Island. <laughs> so I think people, again, building up something much bigger in their head. They think Ellis Island is Statue of Liberty and like this kind of gateway to America. They're not expecting just a fancy municipal building. And so everyone believes that the Statue of Liberty must be, you know, Ellis Island itself, essentially. Yeah. And I think we have such a problem too, like when we talk about immigration into America, we make this this whole grandioso thing, especially during the 1800s and the early 1900s. And they literally were like, you are welcome to Ellis Island. You would see the Statue of Liberty when you arrived. Honestly, you saw the Statue of Liberty from Liberty Island. But you're not going to that island because, again, it's a goddamn island. It's small. It's not. We <laughs> went to Ellis Island because, again, there's a building and they would keep people there if they thought they had, you know, if they brought measles with them or they brought you know, they had rickets or whatever the hell, like immigration was really effing weird. And I watched like a documentary about it and this is totally off topic, but on topic, people just like stayed in that building for so damn long that a lot of them would perish because they were just there. And they were like, yo, it's been like two years. Someone stayed there for like two years and like, they would have just so much death. And it wasn't like it was happy, you know, Disney world. It was the Uh opposite. It was Basically, when we think of like how shitty a sane asylums were, that's what it kind of was. Yeah. It was not a fun process. And I think as Americans, we want to glamorize what our ancestors went through because we, again, don't want to feel bad about things. And I think that's a very American take on history. When you go to these islands, 
from what I read, because again, I've never been to New York City except for like LaGuardia. And you basically have to pick which which island you want to go to. So you can go to Ellis Island. And if you have not done your research, you're just going to show up on an island that doesn't have the Statue of Liberty. Or you're going to go to Liberty Island, which obviously has a Statue of Liberty. But there's people who swear that they went to the Statue of Liberty. And again, talking about these weird photos. And they're just kind of posing in front of this flat looking podium. And people swear that's where the Statue of Liberty used to be. And if you look at them, even with like the respective size of people near it, I'm like, there's no way that was a Statue of Liberty. Oh yeah, Statue of Liberty is massive. Like it's literally like its own skyscraper. It's huge. I know when I did the boat tour, now again, I did did the boat tour around, it was 2000, March of 2008. So practically a billion years ago, but our boat tour took us past Ellis Island. We didn't even stop at Ellis Island because there's not much. There is a museum there now, but not a lot to see. The boat tour did stop at Liberty Island. We were all able to get off and again, do the tour of the Statue of Liberty. But again, we kind of just blazed past Ellis Island. So I think a lot of folks don't realize when they do that kind of boat tour that like most of the people who do that boat tour, it's the Statue of Liberty boat tour. The whole point is you kind of skip past Ellis Island and go to the Statue of Liberty. Most people think, again, because they don't realize that Ellis Island is a different island. They think that's what they're going to. They think that the island they're on is Ellis Island and that Liberty Island, they're like, what do you mean Liberty? That doesn't exist. And it's like, no, you were on Liberty Island. You just weren't really like paying attention. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like it's just a misconception because in history books, especially as Americans, you learned about Ellis Island. You didn't learn about Liberty Island unless you're Mm -hmm. probably from the state of New York. And not even then, it's probably New York City. Did you ever get to go to the Alamo when you lived in San Antonio? I did, yes. So like when we talk, we, meaning Texans, talk about the Alamo, we make it sound like it's the biggest thing in the world, like it's bigger than the governor's mansion. And you show up and you're like, oh my God. This is like the size of a duplex. Yeah, it was weird because I grew up like even, you know, we joke about, you know, Texans, whenever I met Texans, they had minimal history of, you know, the United States. I think in like Texan curriculum in school, it's like a lot of Texan history and not so much American history for your formative years. Yeah. (laughs) Because a lot of kids, I like, or a lot of not kids, obviously I was an adult when I lived there, but a lot of folks I met like had minimal knowledge of like. Plymouth Rock or Jamestown or Yorktown or like basically the the events that led to America and early American history. But in Virginia, we learn, you know, because you start out learning about things like Jamestown and Yorktown. And I remember learning about the Alamo quite a bit. And so I kind of had this very big expectation for what the Alamo was going to be. And then I went and I was kind of like, don't get me wrong, like something very, very incredible and important happened here. Yeah, we lost. Well, yeah, but still, I mean, it's a very incredible and important event. Yeah. And it sets a tone that goes forward that's very important. But at the same time, I was kind of like, in my mind, this was going to be a bigger deal. And not even like a bigger deal, because it's a huge deal. It's in downtown San Antonio. Yeah, I guess there's one, like, you go in, and not to say anything to really, like the effect of, you know, San Antonio is now investing a lot of money and kind of revitalizing yeah. the Alamo. You can tell that I probably since, you know, the recession, they had to probably cut a lot of programs, but there wasn't a lot of stuff happening that really, I guess, took what you were seeing and put it into perspective. So what you're basically seeing is like a building that's very, you know, with some open rooms and some names and plaques and no one to really interpret it for you. And you literally just single file have to walk through it because so many people went through. You were like, yeah. okay, shit, I got to go. This person behind me looks like they're bored. Crap. And yeah. you go early in the morning on a weekday and hope that there's no school tour happening. So you could actually uh-huh. take, like take it all in and they're getting better about it. I mean, they're going to make more, but it's just such a small landmark. And we talk about like everything's bigger in Texas. It's so tiny. So totally off topic talking about Texas. Relevant. It's relevant. I, I think you saw the pictures of these people who literally were taking photos in front of this weird platform thing. Uh-huh. And I really think that they're from Ellis Island and they didn't realize that they were supposed to go somewhere else. Or is there something at Liberty Island that's kind of like a flat platform? I don't remember anything that to say like doesn't mean there isn't anything now, but some of it also kind of looks like when I was looking at some of the photos, not with people in them, but some of the ones with like were from Google Maps. Some of them kind of looked like somebody took the actual podium for the Statue of Liberty, like zoomed out and then photoshopped the Statue of Liberty out of there. It does. <laughs> so I do think to some extent, like the trustworthiness of the internet comes into play because I think when people, you know, buy into these kind of conspiracy theories, there's always an opportunity, especially with the internet being so 
widely available to everybody that people are going to take that opportunity to manipulate the truth in order to either, you know, some people are just kind of getting their kicks out of it. Like I think it's hysterical to perpetuate this idea because they're trolls or people who really believe it's a conspiracy and want to create proof to make their argument more credible. So that's always the, the risk you're running when you see some of those like photos and stuff, because everything can be manipulated and manipulated very well. Yeah. Like we have the technology to Photoshop so many things that make it feel so real. I mean, I just watched this lovely documentary on the Mormon bombings or the bombings of Mormons or whatever. It's on Netflix. And this guy <laughs> was able to fake so many historical documents and he intentionally did them about the Mormons because he grew up in a Mormon family and he was just like, yeah, it's fine. We can just make it up. And he learned that he's yeah. a great forger. And people like that, I mean, it makes you kind of wonder and question some things, but also he was just like finding stuff randomly. And you're like, it's not random when somebody says, I'm looking for this. And then you find it four weeks later. <laughs> That's not yeah. random. It happens once, maybe random. Happens like five, 10 times, probably planted. Yeah. <laughs> but like also there's like paintings where people have painted literally the Ellis Island Municipal Building on with the Statue of Liberty. And I think it's a misconception of the painter. It's not like they sat there on a boat looking at it. They literally probably were told, we want to paint this, we want to make whatever. People just kind of conceptualize what they want to conceptualize. And unless they were looking at a direct picture and they were going off of, you know, like a paint by numbers type of thing, people all the time, I mean, there are people who don't necessarily approve marketing material appropriately. And you're like, oh, did you really like vet that through marketing? Right. And I think like when people make some of these prints, um, especially the ones that you can like go buy at like Michael's or whatever, so you can fancy up your office, they're not always the best prints. Like, right. you're like, this is like a knockoff of a wannabe Van Gogh. <laughs> it's not even a real Van Gogh print. So right. depending on the, the perspective, I mean, if you're looking at Ellis Island from a certain angle, like on a photograph, then yeah, you're probably going to see the Statue of Liberty in the background. And it may look like it's part of Ellis Island because it's a perspective thing. For paintings, I mean, you got to think about like artistic license. Like when someone is commissioned to do a painting of an American landmark and such a massive piece of American history and culture, and you're looking at things like, you know, obviously the Statue of Liberty, go back to like the, the poem on her, you know, give me your tired, your weak, you know, that is literally the Statue of Liberty is there to greet the tired and the weak and the huddled masses who are coming to America to look for a better life. When we think about that, we automatically associate Ellis Island because that's how they come to America is through that system. And so I think for a lot of like paintings and stuff, it is that kind of artistic license of people. They want to have both things represented because they're so important. Yeah. And unless it was commissioned by the United States government, you kind of have <laughs> artistic liberty to do whatever you want. And let's be real, the United States government is exactly known for like always being super truthful. So. <laughs> yeah, that's why we have conspiracy theories about the government that we just don't talk about. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, not even super reliable then necessarily. It just boggles my mind. So going back to the first thing I talked about with that explosion and the, the torch, I don't remember learning about this because I feel like that's something I should have learned in school that that was the first like attack on American soil besides the War of 1812. And I didn't learn about this. I don't know anyone else who learned about it. I'm over here asking Matt. I was like, you know about this? And he's like, what? I'm like, you're from this state. Didn't you have a year devoted to state history? No. <laughs> we just all know that. Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I don't remember learning about it either. Even in college. Now, granted, in college, I was taking much more like targeted things like 20th century French history or stuff like that. So clearly, you know, we weren't learning your basic unless it was in like covered in history 101 or history 102. But yeah, I don't remember learning about it either. I think that if I had to guess, because although it is, you know, kind of the first attack on American soil since the War of 1812, this is going to sound callous, and I don't mean it to be, but, you know, it, it caused the death of, like, four people and a lot of damage. But at the end of the day, like, probably not quite as large as, you know, like, Pearl Harbor, obviously. But I think it kind of gets overshadowed by the Lusitania, if I could be, like, to be honest with you. That's 1915. I think people were still very much reeling from the sinking of the Lusitania. And when you look at an event like that, which is just so horrific. And then you see an event like Black Tom Explosion, which is also, it's very sad. Obviously, those four people died and there's a lot of damage going on. It's not quite the same caliber as the thinking of the Lusitania. So I do think that that overshadows it. No, I agree with you, especially like Lusitania was a loss of a, not only like American lives, but 
during that time, we still, as Americans, had a boatload, like legit, literally a boatload of relatives still over in Europe and, you know, travel. Mm-hmm. That was how you did your mode of transportation. The only difference in my mind is that this necessarily still didn't push us into World War I because all it did was destroy $20 million at that time which is like way more now of not just military, but also like there was train cars. So a lot of infrastructure as well as ammunition that was supposed to go over, supposed to go to the allies, <laughs> but it's like 400 something million, I think is what it'd be valued today. So to lose $400 million, I mean, for our military budget nowadays, you kind of sit there and go, that's not that bad. That's not much. But back yeah. then, we didn't really have the bolstering military industrial complex. So that's a lot of money. And the fact that we, like, first off, the fact that that didn't also push us into World War One necessarily still kind of boggles my mind. That's, it's just weird. But also, yeah, I don't know. I'm just rambling now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard because I think, you know, anytime you're looking at a thing where it's like, okay, the intent was to blow up munitions or like military supplies four people were killed in the process but when you look at something like Lusitania where it's like 2,000 people passengers like people not involved in the war it's different I think that everyone expects in a war that military complexes or munitions factories or things like that they may get targeted but nobody expects for innocent civilians to be targeted. And so I think that's why it probably didn't get that much of att- much attention. I agree with that too. I just, again, I'm surprised to not learn about that, but also yeah. that like all of 20th century history was so rushed that the stuff we like talked about in American history for the 20th century was just learn it on your own guys. <laughs> have fun. So I can understand not having mentions of it, but I'm like, if we would learn more about the 20th century history, we understand where we are now. And then maybe we wouldn't have conspiracy theories. Right. But like the Statue of Liberty, I'm like, I know that there are two different islands, but that's because I've also educated myself to know. Right. I would venture to say that most people don't know that unless they've been, or unless they have like, you know, like they're like a history buff or they've studied it or in some kind of capacity. It's just not something you really think about. Honestly, like I, I would have never, and, and prior to going to the Statue of Liberty, it's not something I would have ever been like, hmm, I wonder if the Statue of Liberty is actually on Ellis Island. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just see these artists rendering or these photos that make it look like it's literally the same place and you don't know. You just kind of take that for granted because, you know, the way, especially like our generation, we're very visual learners, whether we want it to be mm-hmm. or not. So you see this and you're like, okay, that looks like this. I'm down with this. That's what I see. That's what I should know. And right. as like, this is like a conspiracy theory that they moved the Statue of Liberty or that, you know, there's photos without it. I'm like, this is pretty debunked, like out of the Mandela effects. I'm like, this is the one that I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's well, and this is actually something kind of referencing back to what we were just talking about. Like my, I took a class on, you know, 20th century France. And this is something that we talked about a lot in that class because it's a, a term kind of called like collective memory. <laughs> So collective memory is kind of in the terms of my class on France was, if you look at France now, everybody will swear that they were part of the resistance during World War II. France was part of the resistance, Charles de Gaulle, Viva la France, like the whole nine yards, right? Well, France also was like one of the leading exporters of Jewish people during World War II. But again, that collective memory, everyone is remembering they were freedom fighters. Well, the reality is not everyone was freedom fighters and people that were, were risking their lives because the collective larger group was very much supporting Germany. We see this a lot in America with the Civil War. There's a lot of debate on, was it states' rights or was it slavery? And the reality is it's collective memory. Groups of people always like to remember things the way that almost romanticizes it. And I think that's one of these things where, again, we're kind of romanticizing immigration, even though we know immigration is not a pretty thing. And I think that's to be said for a lot of these Mandela effect things. We're kind of, we're collectively believing like the Berenstein Bears thing, and it's actually the Berenstain Bears or whatever, because collectively we kind of, it's like that change blindness. Like you don't, your brain reads like the first, the beginning and the end of the sentence, and you don't necessarily read all the letters in between, and it just kind of fills in the blank. You know, you don't really notice it over time. So collectively, we've all decided that, well, that must be like a Mandela effect thing because I don't remember it and they don't remember it. So clearly it can't be real. Like, (laughs) And you find people that fit your ideology and it's so much easier to find people that fit your ideology now with social media. And (laughs) Reddit. (laughs) 
<gasps> yeah. Anything. Well, Reddit. I love Reddit. Don't get me wrong, but it has become a cesspool for people to find other people that believe the same shitty and or crazy things they believe. <laughs> Yeah. Like if you want to come up with your own conspiracy theory, I think at this point in time, you are totally able to do so. And you will find people to believe it with you, even if they've never heard of it. Because the whole idea of a conspiracy theory is that because it seems so far-fetched or the answer is too real to like, just make sense on how something happened, there's now a conspiracy theory about it. And that happens a lot. Yeah. It's just like, you know, the collective memory, I think is a really great way to not, I wouldn't say dismiss this conspiracy theory technically, but to be like, I'm going to, let me show you, I'm going to prove you wrong. (laughs) It's it's almost a coping mechanism. It's a way for us to convince ourselves that there's no way that, you know, we, all of our childhood just really weren't paying attention to how the Berenstein Bears is spelled. Clearly, like we can't be that sick. Right. So yeah, it kind of, it's almost like a coping mechanism. It is. And I think that it, it applies not only to things like spelling and reading, but to, you know, history and to our experience as well. You know, our brains may not remember all the details. Again, some of it's selective hearing. Some of it is that hype that we've built up. But I don't remember my entire experience of the Statue of Liberty tour. I, it's been a long time. There's just no way for me to remember all of it. I remember highlights. But I'm sure that in some ways, my brain has probably filled in some of those things with information that I know or that I think I know to help to round out that experience so it makes sense. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you're going through, you know, um, Joaquin Phoenix's version of the Joker where you're just making people to, you know, fulfill this fantasy you have. I mean, I might be. Who knows? Uh- <laughs> you know what, maybe you turn to life and you guys had a conversation and if that's happened, then you might become the Joker. Yes. <laughs> I'm okay with this. I'm okay with being friends with the Joker. Because you have dogs and they're pretty sweet. I mean, yeah. So it's... it's that's a thing. <laughs> you would be just a well-rounded, fun person if that were right. all. But there's people <laughs> that legit have very interesting interpretations of how conversations even happen. So I think I'm going to end this episode because definitely debunked conspiracy theory. About debunked for sure. A show about the Statue of Liberty. As always, thank you for listening to you, but have you heard about it? I'm your host, Courtney. I was joined today by my fabulous friend, Jess. Thank hey. you. And we hope you have a fabulous rest of your day. Bye.